I am now thrilled to introduce tonight's moderator. He is a four-time Emmy Award-winning TV interviewer who estimates he's interviewed about 3,000 people, so tonight it's 3,001. He is having a remarkably diverse career in television, which includes hosting 18 different programs, local and national, during the past 40 years. The well-known Midday with Bill Boggs at Channel 5 for 13 years, the syndicated Comedy Tonight and Fox, uh, for Fox and the game show All Star Anything Goes for CBS. He spent 10 years on air at the Food Network, where he hosted three different shows, notably his creation, Bill Boggs' Corner Table, which was the network's first non-cooking show. In addition, he's covered boxing for Showtime and has two adventure series on the Travel Channel. He is currently seen on the syndicated PBS program, My Generation. He was the executive producer of the revolutionary Morton Downey Jr. program, as well as the executive pr producer of Court TV. He is currently working with the music authority, Will Friedwald on a new music series for PBS Songs of Our Time. For all that he does, his favorite thing is sitting down and interviewing successful people about their lives, which is, which is what he's going to do tonight with us with Tony Roberts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Bill Boggs. Thank you. That's nice. Very nice. Hi, everybody. She hasn't done anything yet. If she gets it, not me. Oh, Tony Roberts, uh, where to begin? Well, I've been in New York since 1975, and Tony Roberts was one of the very first people I met. I remember uh, I used to see him at Studio 54, and now I see him at the chiropractors with me. Uh, um, when I told people over the course of the last couple of, um, last couple of months, actually, that I was going to be interviewing Tony Roberts, every time I said his name, people's faces would light up. You know, he he's truly is a beloved actor, a stage performer, a singer, a song and dance man, uh, obviously a film actor, and he's had a share of television, too. I actually wrote out some of the formal credits here, but uh, I just want to say, personally, what a pleasure it is that I could be here interviewing Tony. Some of the things he's done. First, of note, he made his stage debut. You know where? right here on this stage when he was 10 years old. 10 years old on this stage, right? He's a native New Yorker. This is not like an actor imported from Cleveland pretending to be a New Yorker. This is a native New Yorker who grew up in this neighborhood, right? Went to PS6, like right around the corner. Some of the credits, well, obviously, all those great movies with Woody, right? Annie Hall playing against Sam. Radio Days, Stardust Memories, Midsummer Night's Sex Comedy. Hannah and her sisters on stage, Barefoot in the Park, right? that great production, Neil Simon, How Now, Dal Jones, Victor Victoria, Scrooge down at Madison Square Garden, wow, 22 films. You remember Cirque Serpico with Al Pacino, that scene that they had together, Amityville 3D, The Taking of Pelham, one, two, three, or everybody's favorite, Million Dollar Duck, Million Dollar Duck is on this man's resume, okay? Woody Allen says about his friend, Tony Roberts, he seems to strive for some kind of excellence for himself in what he does that keeps him from anything that smells of a sense of smugness. Here is a wonderful man, Tony Roberts. In person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, here we are. Yes. We've talked about this for a while. Uh, remember when we chatted on the phone? Uh, I said, I think maybe linear. We should be a little linear. Linear. So let's start at the beginning. What do you remember about your debut on this stage? I'm, in a, I'm gonna have a panic attack because <laughs> when I came out on stage, I was immediately soaked from head to toe by three juvenile delinquents who were in the front row with water pistols. And I uh, couldn't figure it out at first, and I thought, I didn't know I was that nervous. Why am I sweating so much? <laughs> How old were you, 10? 10. 10. And uh, it went uphill from there. It, uh, <laughs> but that was my memory of this very spot, which I haven't been on since that moment. 
So, isn't that wonderful? Anybody got a water pistol? <laughs> so what takes a 10-year-old to the stage? Your father was a very successful radio announcer, Ken Roberts. Your mother, you grew up in a, your, your mother's an actress? No, my mother uh, worked for uh, Max Fleischer, who produced the Betty Boop cartoons. So you grew up in a show business milieu. And the Popeye cartoons, yes. She wasn't a performer. No. She was a girl Friday, and she was uh, very clever, and uh, eventually was asked to be a writer for The Tonight Show. Ooh. But uh, she, uh, she was too shy uh, to, to, to go forward with that. Uh, but my father, who had wanted to be an actor, and whose name I think is etched on the back of one of the seats downstairs, contributed to the building of this uh, establishment. Wow. And I entered acting classes here with Jessica Walter, who I uh, uh, <laughs> was in the same class with. Uh, they had a marvelous acting teacher here by the name of Muriel Sharon. And uh, she uh, had us discover acting in a very contemporary Stanislavski-oriented way. Uh, we acted out uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware. How old were you at this point? Nine or ten. Or, really? Or eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, my mother was upset that I didn't get cast in a play quickly enough. <laughs> and uh, called the school. I can remember being in the kitchen and she was on the phone and said, well, he's been going there for four months. And he, <laughs> it's a stage, he mother. hasn't had a part yet. Well, let's get, back, ah. let's get back to the question. What takes a 10-year-old to the stage? A 10-year-old could be in a playground. A 10-year-old could be home playing checkers. What was there in either you or your milieu or both that got you interested in this? Radio. Radio. Yeah, because so. this was the 1940s. We didn't have a television until I was about 10. Uh, but I listened to the radio all the time. And I knew all the broadcasts, all the programs. But better than that was that my father would take me with him when I was seven, eight, nine to the recording studios, where we would sit in a room uh, no bigger than this stage. And I would watch grown ups in suits and ties, who could have been lawyers and doctors, pretend uh, to be uh, cops and robbers and astronauts and politicians, and they would act in front of a little piece of metal this big on a st stand, but their bodies and their expressions were so invested in what their story was that it was like watching grown-ups behave like children. Mm. And that was what did it for me, because I thought, well, if you never have to grow up, <laughs> why do it? And I, I wanted to act out and pretend the same way these people were doing. They were adults. They were getting paid. But what fun! And they, uh, they invested so much belief in it that to a kid, to a child, it was the best game anybody would ever invented, and that's what did it originally. And uh, I was discouraged from wanting to have a career as that by, because who, who of my father, my father and my cousin Everett Sloan, who was in the Mercury Players for Orson Welles and in Citizen Kane and in other movies of Orson's. And so was my father's best friend, a man named Paul Stewart, who played the butler in uh, Citizen Kane and who was in a movie called The Window, who was in In Cold Blood. He plays the, uh, so the they're, reporter. So they're telling you, don't do don't this? Don't do this. Why? What were the, what, what because were the... of two reasons that, I, that come to mind the quickest. One was how easily it wa easy it was to be unemployed, how <laughs> unemployed was the constant. I can that, identify with that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> we all can. I mean, that was their, their struggle. They never had the security of being anything else. And huh. my father said, you don't want to do this. Be a doctor uh, or, or be a lawyer uh, or be something that gives you some kind of security. Right. Uh, the second reason why uh, they didn't want me to do it was because when I was 10, the blacklist hit. And all of those people I just ne mentioned, Paul, my cousin Everett, Orson, uh, my father, were all blacklisted. Oh, my word. And they uh, suddenly uh, were expelled from the business for about three or four years until 
the wheel came around and the blacklist sort of got pushed into the background. What was that like in your home? In other words, it was the, the crisis. Not working. It was the was... crisis of my uh, of my growing up because really? I remember the 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 fear and the crying of what are we going to do? That we had just moved to Stamford, Connecticut because things were going well and we moved out of the city and we had a big estate and suddenly this blacklist thing mm -hmm. came along and a book came out called Red Channels yeah. which listed everybody's name and suddenly the phone stopped ringing. Wow. And um, it was a traumatic time for it to happen. If it had happened when I was four or five years old, I, I, it wouldn't have touched me. And, or if it happened when I was 16 or 17, I don't think it would have been such a big deal. Right. But coming right at that point before high school, it was a devastating blow. But I never saw those feelings before or after from uh, from your parents, from any of that, from my parents, from Everett, and from Paul, from all their friends, from everybody. But it didn't discourage you. You, know, you. you kept marching. I mean, if we're talking linear, because just quickly. I, you literally started here on the stage and kept studying acting through high school, right? PS6, college, Northwestern. Yes. And were on stage professionally when you were 22? 21. 21, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was inspired in two ways. Uh, yeah. I was inspired because I was taken to the theater as a young man. I was taken to see Orson Welles around the world in 80 days when I was six or seven, and he pointed a gun at the ceiling of the theater and fired it off, and feathers came down on the entire audience. And I mean, if that wasn't enough to sell you on what this was, <clears throat> uh, uh, going to those radio broadcasts fairly regularly and sitting there and watching these people act out uh, did it. And then as I started to act in plays in here at the YMHA, I became aware of a phenomenon that I've heard a lot of actors speak of where your, your face is hot on the side that's facing the audience. Huh. It's heat. Yeah. It's like a sensor in there mm. that feels the eyes, huh. that felt the, uh, I, I think probably in retrospect after a lot of analysis I can say that it's because you suddenly feel that you are the center of attention and you are in command of uh, a room full of strangers. Feeling it now? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because they're not strangers. Uh. <laughs> no, it's because these are my own lines. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's a difference. It makes a difference. Well, okay, so you, you know, the, the one thing I wrote down here after our conversation was hearing all this about how you were so taken with this as, as, a, young, as a youngster, as a little kid, was a question, nature or nurture? Mm. Meaning, you got it. So you, obviously this is great, you're interested, but there had to be an intrinsic talent that you had that connected with the passion that was growing in your childhood, right? It depends on how you want to define talent. And I, 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 uh, was, it was defined to me, uh, or by second hand, as to what Stella Adler defined it as. Great acting teacher from a great acting family, Luther Adler and others. And Stella Adler was a great, great acting teacher. Uh, I, I didn't study with her. I auditioned for her once, and uh, she was lovely to me and uh, gave me a great piece of advice. Uh, I, I, I got up to do the Biff speech from uh, Death of a Salesman about his having moved around so much and never been able to hold a job anyplace. And she said to me, uh, uh, he, he obviously l likes to move around a lot and can't hold a job and is moving around, isn't that true? I said, yes. She said, well, then why did you do the whole scene sitting down in a chair? <laughs> she said, go stand up as if you're leaning against a tree and move around and don't stop and do it again. Well, suddenly you start to feel all these things and you feel the restlessness of the character. Fade out, fade in. Anyway, uh, Stella Adler gave me that bit of advice, but said talent is the ability to learn. There you go. So I didn't know there at nine whether That's, I had the yeah. ability to learn. I never knew what talent was. I didn't know if I was talented. I never knew. Um, I mean, it's always qualified anyway. How talented are you? Well, I'm as talented as my career took me. And you but that's not worked. entirely true because there's too much that goes into a career beyond talent that, that yeah. there are a lot of talented people who never get to first base because talent is one of three or four other things you got to have including luck and drive 
And those have nothing to do with talent. Right. And there are a lot of people with luck and drive who get there and they don't have any talent. And a lot of people with talent who don't have the luck or the drive. Right. So I don't know. It's a, I can certainly say I was lucky because I grew up in an environment of theater and I loved theater. So One, You know something, anytime I hear a successful person like you just you know, say, I was lucky, it reminds me of one quote I love. George Roy Hill, who directed Redford and Newman and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Paul Newman was always one to say how lucky he was, how lucky he was. And George Roy Hill said, Paul, with you, luck is an art. Mm. So let's move to, <laughs> Tony is a fountain of wonderful stories. Let's, tell us about your stage debut. What happened that night? On Broadway, you mean? Yeah, Broadway, your, excuse me, your Broadway debut. <laughs> I was in a play called, um, uh, Something about a soldier. People would always just say to me, what was the name of it? Don't you remember the name of it? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was the name of it again? The name. <laughs> <laughs> the name was Something About a Soldier. And it starred Ralph Meeker, who was a big star at that time. He'd starred on Broadway in Picnic. Yeah. And Sal Mineo, oh, who was a big Sal star Mineo. at the same time, yes. And Kevin McCarthy, who wow. was a big star. And uh, an ensemble of uh, new guys like myself. And I had one wonderful scene in the, in the second act of this play in which I'm handcuffed to Sal Minio on a train. And Ralph Meeker is supposed to be a sergeant who comes into the train and uh, is drunk. And he eventually uh, makes me get off at the wrong station. And I miss my furlough home and the whole thing. One nice little scene. It's a good scene. And Ralph on opening night, <laughs> forgive me Ralph, but Ralph had had a few before the show. <laughs> and Ralph came on stage, we looked at each other, and he said the last line of the scene. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, my parents were out front. My parents were there. Now you're feeling the heat all over your I face. I could huh? not. So I said that I kept going back. It was about three times I had to say the second line of the scene to remind him that he'd just cut out three pages. My only three pages. <laughs> so when it was over, and he did eventually go back up to the top, and we Good. did the scene, and it was fine. And Dory Shari, who had directed it and partly produced it with the Theater Guild, came back and he said, you saved the show. He said, you were like a fire engine out there. He said, you wouldn't be deterred. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was my opening night on Broadway, and of course the, uh, the play got terrible reviews and closed in a week and a half, and uh, I'll never forget sitting with um, a man who later became uh, the founder of the Royal Shakespeare Company in England, uh, who was an actor, his name will come to me probably tomorrow, <laughs> but uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, this is the best thing that could happen to you, kid. I said, what do you mean? He said, if you're in a hit, you get stuck, you know the same people, you don't learn anything anymore. He said, the best thing that could happen to you is you'll be in three or four or five flops in a row, huh. which is exactly what happened. <laughs> he said, you'll learn new tricks, you'll learn new actors, you'll get comfortable, you won't get rich. He said, you'll stay where you should be at this level of your career. And that was my opening night. Was that Derek Jacoby? No. Okay, just checking. Good guess. Um, all right, how about the, one of your early appearances on a soap opera? Larry Hagman. Yes, Larry Hagman, uh, who, who was the star of The Edge of Night when I was on it with my first television role, which was an under five, which was a category you got paid through after uh, for uh, having less lines than somebody who got a full week's regular salary or a full day's regular salary. If you had under five lines, you got paid a third of what other people got paid. But I worked so hard on those five lines that when we got up to rehearse it, and the shows were on live in those days, uh, so you came in at 10.30 in the morning and the regulars who were on the show spent the first hour of rehearsal talking about how drunk they were the night before, or what had happened, or what terrible play they'd gone to see. Now they were going to go on live in three or four hours. <laughs> so finally everybody staggers into position to do the first scene, and they have their scripts in their hand and everything. I didn't need the script. And I am standing behind an airport airlines counter 
I even brought a hat and I had a pad and Larry Hagman staggers over to me with his script and he says to me, uh, is the flight from Phoenix going to be on time? And I said, no, I think that flight's going to be a little late today. And I looked him just in the eye with every bit of conviction that I had in my body. And he looked at me like a, he'd been hit by a, a rock. And he said, you're not going to act, are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I never acted again. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, that that was, was enough to do it for me. That, Spencer Tracy gave some young, <laughs> young actor a piece of advice, don't let anybody catch you doing it. You know, that's right. Like that. That's right. Let, let's move to giant hit. By the way, I saw Neil Simon today. Today? Yes. Really? I was down at the Palace Restaurant on West 57th Street, which is really basically a diner named the Palace Restaurant. And I was upstairs and went to the men's room. Coming back from the men's room, he was sitting there engaged in a conversation while eating. I did not want to interrupt him, but it was just great to see him. So yes. Neil, the great Neil Simon. Oh, good. Let's go to Barefoot in the Park, directed by Mike Nichols, right? Yes. Originally, Redford was the original star. You replaced, you went in after Redford. Well, there's not a bad story there. If you Yeah, can the Redford story is really, this, this is fascinating. Well, uh, Redford opened in Barefoot in the Park. It was an enormous hit. It made Mike Nichols uh, the, the uh, George Abbott of the moment. Uh, it was a huge hit. And my girlfriend at the time was Penny Fuller. Huh. And she had replaced Elizabeth Ashley in the leading role of Barefoot on Broadway. And she'd been playing it for about four or five months. And Redford was due for his vacation of two weeks. So they, uh, they had an understudy. And the understudy was going to take over for Redford for the two weeks that he was gone. Only um, they needed an understudy for the understudy in case, God forbid, something happened to the understudy. So Penny said to them, my boyfriend uh, couldn't do this. And I came in and I auditioned and they hired me to be the understudy for two weeks. Well, in those days, every team fielded a team, a baseball, softball team in the Broadway Show League. And uh, Barefoot was no different. And I was now a member of the cast, even for three days or something. So I went to the park to see the ball game. And my understudy at the time got up, but got up at the plate, got a hit, and tried to stretch a single into a double and got tagged out at second base and was writhing in pain, holding his ankle. And everybody went from the bleachers, running out to see how he was, except me. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that my big break was his break. <laughs> his ankle. And sure enough, I went on for those two weeks. Wow. And th that's why when Redford did leave, and here I, I have to fudge a little truth. Uh, they actually hired Robert Reed from the, the uh, uh, Defenders yeah. to play, uh, to replace Redford. And he went on for three months and he didn't like doing it for some reason and they weren't happy with him. And you were still understudy, right? Uh, at that point, uh, yes, I guess I was you the understudy. You held, held the understudy position. I think I did. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did, but I'm not even sure. Anyway, so what happened? So he's in it for three months. So he, they, and they, 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 he left, and they hired me. That's and funny. I stayed in it for 17 months. Now, a couple of things from that. First, the, if we remember Barefoot in the Park, the entrance of the male star yeah. comes up. They're living on what, the fourth floor? It's a five floor? Six. Six floor. So every time somebody comes in, they're totally out of breath. Just what Mike Nichols wanted people to do for the reality of that entrance yeah. where you've just come up six flights of steps. He gave the cast an assignment. He said, I want you all to go home and I want you to work yourself into a state of an exhaustion that you've never felt before and remember what it felt like. And uh, uh, it worked for everybody. Uh, I wasn't there when this happened. Yeah. This was the first time around. But Redford was so diligent about finding the truth of that exhaustion that uh, he ran around the entire block was 47th Street, it was the Biltmore Theater. He would run to Broadway, up a block, down back to 8th Avenue, back down to 47th Street, and arrive just at the moment that his entrance was due. So when he came in that door, he had the pain and agony oh. of that feeling, and you didn't need a line for five minutes, because it, 
it was just so real that mm. everybody understood what he had just done. And yet they were laughing too at the same time. Well, sure, but yeah. Simon would just put people in those situations where, you know, yeah. there were funny situations. And one quick thing on Nichols. You must have had some interchanges with Mike Nichols. Very little, hardly Very little. Any. All right, fine. We, we can, As we, a matter of fact, the most he did was to say, good work, Roberts. When uh, he saw me on the street uh, a couple of weeks after I'd opened, and uh, he happened to see me, I was coming out the stage door, and he was going by, and I'd, 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 I don't even know if I'd met him. Hmm. He just said, good work, Roberts, and that was it. I worked for him three, four times after that, but hmm. at the, in that initial case, that was it. You did five Broadway shows consecutively for David Merrick. Yeah. David Merrick, known as a really tough guy. What, <laughs> what, did, what was the connection there that made it work for you with David Merrick? Had to be some, he liked you, there had to be some special. He liked me enough to have me come in audition for the first play that I did for him five times because it was a Woody Allen's first play on Broadway called Don't Drink the Water. Right. And um, uh, Woody didn't see what he saw and he kept having me back uh, to do it again. And finally he said to Woody, just go to see him, go to see him in Barefoot in the Park, you'll mm -hmm. see. So one night, after 17 months of doing Barefoot, Woody walked into my dressing room with Louise Lasser, who he was married to at the time, and he said to me, uh, he said, why do you audition so terribly? He said, you're wonderful, you're, you, you, you got the part. He said, but he said, you don't audition very well. I said, I know. I said, I can't do it until I know the material and it's I feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that was the first time that I, I worked for Woody and David and, uh, I worked for David in four shows after that. Uh, I don't know, he felt comforted by my own uh, um, fear of him. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was afraid of him. Right. And uh, he arrived in an entourage of men in black coats and hats and uh, white ties, and they, he, there were three or four of them together. And for some reason or other, he got into the habit of leaving his coat, his overcoat, in my dressing room. And if he had a few minutes, he would sit down and he would say to me, I had a very rough week and I'm putting my makeup on. What, what happened? What happened, Mr. Merrick? And he'd say, well, we're in Boston with uh, Tiffany, with, bear, 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 with the breakfast at Tiffany's and it's not going well and I don't know who to fire and I don't know what to do. And, uh, and um, I just said, well, I'm, I'm just so happy to be here, Mr. Merrick. You know, it's just, I just think you're the best producer that ever was. <laughs> And uh, then, then he would go away and, you know, I would breathe again. Uh, but he liked me and I did. He well, also negotiated your entire contract uh, the moment you finished your audition. He would come right up out of the theater and he would say, okay. And my agent would be standing there. Uh -huh. And he'd say, uh, I'll give you uh, uh, $1,000 a week uh, and I, not, I want two years. And I didn't know if that was good or bad or what it was. I was uh, 27 years old and uh, my agent said nothing. Not a word at this point. And uh, I was sold for $1,000 a week, which was pretty good at that yeah, point. It was twice sure. what I made in Barefoot. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, he what should. were the five, for the five consecutive shows for Merrick? Well, the first was Don't Drink the Water. Right. The second was a big musical called uh, um, How Now Dow Jones. Well, I saw that. Which I was. Philadelphia. Right. I got a Tony nomination, but I didn't win. I lost to Robert Goulet. Uh, the third one was, uh, um, again, I guess, Play It Again, Sam, which was Woody's second play. Yeah. Then came Sugar, or the first came Promises, Promises. Ah, uh, what a nice And that was in London, and then on Broadway, both places, and in London it was a huge hit. And then it was, um, the last one was um, Sugar, with sure. Bobby Morse and... Uh, I gotta do Cyril this. Richard. I was shaving, you know, before coming over here, I was thinking about promises, promises. I just want you to respond to this. Right? What do you get when you fall <laughs> in love? You only get lies and pain and sorrow. So for at least until tomorrow, I'll, I'll never, never fall, fall in love, love again. again. All right. <laughs> ah, these things come to you when you, you got soap on your face. Thank you, thank you. Um, same question about Woody, though. The same question as uh, with David Merrick. What was the, the you, you know, your fabled repu reputation with Woody? What happened that made it work with Woody through all those movies, you know? Ultimately, I think it was that um, he was so, in his own way, shy 
and uh, retiring and uh, uh, paranoid in many ways about people taking a picture of him or anything, that very few people ever really uh, told him the truth about himself. Huh. I mean, he was in, you know, everybody was in awe of his genius. Yeah. When we were in uh, Play It Again Sam together, he couldn't stand to be in his dressing room alone uh, from half hour to curtain. So he would come to my room and he would pace up and down the floor for 25 minutes. This was after we'd been running for two or three months or four months. By that time, it's, you know, it's like falling off a log, really. And uh, finally, at some point, I said to him, what are you so nervous about? Why are you so crazy? And I don't think anybody would ever really said <laughs> that to him. Right. And in a way, it, uh, it opened up a, uh, a communication between both of us. He trusted me to be able to tell him he was nuts and still be his friend the mm. next day. Yeah. And I think that's what bonded us. Um, he felt uh, comfortable about it. I know in Annie Hall, one of the questions I get asked the most of that, uh, that picture and everything is, well, how, why do you call each other Max? He yeah. says, you call each other Max all the way through the movie. Well, it was written in the script that we call each other Max. And people say, well, why did that happen? Well, it happened because I was supposed to meet him for a catch in Central Park, a softball catch, and I was late, and I saw him waiting outside 72nd Street and 5th Avenue, and he was pacing around. And he was in his uh, field jacket and some crazy pair of pants, and he looked m like a madman with a fishing hat. And uh, I said, Woody, 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 I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'll be right there. And when I got up to him, he said, listen, he said, you must never call me Woody in, in public. And I said, really? Why not? And he said, because the people will know who I am. <laughs> and I said, did you ever think that maybe they know who you are because no one would dress like that? <laughs> You're the only person in this entire Upper East Side who would walk around like that. So he said, never mind that. He said, just don't, don't call me Woody in public. I said, oh, all right. I said, I'll call you Max. He said, fine. And I called him Max for about six months, and then one day my phone rang, and I pick it up, and it's his voice, and he says, hello, Max. And we haven't called each other anything but Max ever since to this day. Wow. So I can't explain that. You know, but time is flying here, and I've got a lot of notes. I would just to run through some more stories. Um, auditioning for Julie Stein? You don't like auditioning? Mm. Or well, I'm going to say you don't like it. You well, I it. like it so little that when somebody said to me, and I think it was at Burton Lane's house at a party that I was at, uh, I mean, I really had a great uh, entree into a lot of this yeah. world that made it much easier for me than it is for the average Joe. And here I am at uh, this party with 50 or 60 people on Central Park West at, uh, I think it was Burton Lane's house. He and my parents were friends in Lynn Lane. And uh, suddenly Julie Stein comes up to me, who I'd never met, and he said, I understand you're coming into audition for my show next week. I said, yes, I am. This was Sugar. Uh, which was taken from the movie Some Like It Hot. And he said, I'll tell you what. He said, if you sing for me now, here, you don't have to come in and sing for me next week. Hmm. So I weighed that in my head, and I thought, better now. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And the room calmed down, and I sang Every Night at Seven, which is a Burton Lane song. He played the piano for Ooh, me. Oh, that's great. And I sang it with a gathering of like 25 people around this piano, and uh, I got the part. Mm. And that was a, but a there nice you, story. We see in two stories luck, certain luck there, a luck, you know, with the broken ankle. So there's one of the three or four components. I once was told that luck is the residue of design, yeah. and I like that. <laughs> I don't know if it means anything. Well, luck is like when it. preparation meets opportunity. Luck is when you get out of the house every morning at uh, 9 o'clock, as my father insisted that I do, with my resume and pictures in hand uh -huh. and properly dressed and groomed, and didn't come back until 4 or 5 o'clock that afternoon, having spent the day making rounds, yeah, which right. is impossible these days you know, because something. nobody has offices anymore. If it's all done on th this stuff. But in those days, you went downtown, you went in, they threw you out, you went to the next office, they threw you out, you went to, had lunch with a couple of actors someplace, you went 
went around, you went to four or five more places and got thrown out, but you did this five days a week. How do you fight doubt when that happens, day after day after day? Because doubt has got to enter your mind if you're being thrown out. Being but everybody else is getting thrown out too. It's not like you're <laughs> sitting in a room with 10 people who just got in the door and you're and then not. you're the one who has to leave. No, huh? they throw everybody <laughs> out. They think you're crazy when you start. Because you are. I mean, the first thing they think is you must be mad to want to do this and yeah. to think that you have a chance to do it. So until you show up a year later or two years later, they don't even think you're serious about it. Because they think you're here for two months and then you'll go home just like everybody else does. But if you're still here in a year and a half, you know the secretary, you know the person in the outside office, those are the people who will replace the agents who are there at the moment who you don't know. So when they get to be agents, they know you, and they know you're not a flake. They know that if you're told to go someplace for a rehearsal, you'll show up, and you'll show up opening night. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's uh, wrong to be discouraged if you don't get anywhere in six months or a year. That's nothing in this business. They know whether you've been around for a while from the most and the first step you take onto the stage mm. to do your audition. They know right then in that moment whether you're ready or not. You may not, you, they know instantly how you come in that room, whether you are someone who they're gonna hire or they're gonna just pass on. And you don't develop that facade, that assurity, that confidence, that swagger, that whatever it is, until you've been around for a year or two. Tony, what do you think has contributed to your longevity in the business? Oh. I mean, you're talking about the early days of making the rounds, and we're sitting here now talking about a brilliant career which is still going on. If you had to like, reach within yourself for one quality that Tony Roberts has that has helped him prevail, what would that be? Gee, that's a good question. I guess I, I, I ambition, I couldn't do anything else. I wasn't any good at anything else. Mm. And um, I, I wasn't originally uh, going to be a singer, and, and I never have been a singer. I mean, I've sung in shows, you of sound, course, but... You have wonderful tone. Thank you. But uh, that's high school of music and art, a couple of classes, and, yeah. and some people along the way who I studied with, who worked with everybody else who sings on Broadway um, um, and gets you into some kind of performance muscle strength. Mm -hmm. But um, I never danced. I, uh, I, I danced in Jerome Robbins' Broadway. Jerome Robbins taught me himself how to do a step. He said, the way you're doing it, I couldn't even do it. <laughs> 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 but there has to be a lot of practice behind that to make it look. There's, there's, there's determination. I, there's determination. I mean, I, I didn't go home at night and, and, and uh, you know, uh, goof off. I mean, I, I knew my lines, I knew my steps, I, I, I tortured myself to, to do as much as I could so that I could walk in the next day and, and bring something and be prepared. I know a lot of actors leave the rehearsal and they do nothing between that time and the time they're due the next day at rehearsal. They don't do anything. And I used to do a lot uh, so that I came... Like what? Well, I would write subtexts, uh, the, 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 the underthoughts behind the lines, I would seek to determine what I wanted in each scene I was uh, acting in, what was my uh, objective, uh, my intention, uh, what, what did I, why did I come in the, into this particular room? Where did I come from? Mm -hmm. What did it mean to me uh, whether or not this woman responded to me or whether I got the job or whether I, whatever. I was uh, tried to create the circumstances of the play, uh, making them real f to myself. And put, you put the time in. Well, yeah. I, I had seen people fired in the first five days of rehearsal. In, the, in my early career, I had been fired. I was fired from a television pilot in California when I was 22. Hmm. Uh, wept all the way down Sunset Boulevard. Uh, got on a plane, left town. Uh, uh, it was a terrible experience. Uh, my mother cut a, an article out of the New York uh, Daily News by Walter Winchell. Uh, listing all of the famous people who'd been fired, and it was everybody. Oh. I mean, you know, everybody had been fired at least once. I mean, I didn't even feel I like qualified yet because I hadn't been <laughs> fired two or three times. But uh, I, I was quite scared uh, from that experience ever on that I would always be fired, uh, that, that you didn't know it was coming, that whenever the director and the writers went off for a conference with the producer, whether it was a television show or a movie or a play, 
they were signing your death warrant. So it was a lot of uh, insecurity. That kept you tight, though. That kept you making the extra effort, I would think. Well, it was, all, it, it was that plus the terrible uh, odds that were against you. Huh. which had been embedded in me from uh, my cousin Everett, from my father's best friend Paul Stewart, from my father, from everybody they, uh, from the people who were in Jack Guilford's Zero Mostel. These were family uh, friends. Yeah. And all they ever talked about was how cruel and unfair and unjust and insecure this business was. They were always in financial problems. They never felt safe uh, buying a house, buying a car, doing anything because every job would end. Whether it was a show or a movie or whatever it was, a radio program, it lasted a couple of days or a couple of months and then it was over and you were on the street again. It's the same way now. But you have to uh, want it badly enough uh, to be it. convinced that uh, that's, this is the only th reason you really want to get up in the morning, is to play cops and robbers and get paid for it. Why not? You know, I'm looking at the, we've got plenty of time left. I, I want to shift to Q&A if we have some questions from the audience. Otherwise, we can, we can keep going for a long time. But just, uh, yeah, just bark it right out. My mother, I think, had gone to high school or knew Milton in high school, and they were friends, and Milton was a friend of the family's, and eventually even Milton uh, took an apartment in the building on 88th Street that uh, I grew up in. Which uh, Milton are we talking Milton about? Milton Burrow. Milton Burrow. Okay, I want to make sure because the, yeah. the mics didn't pick that up. I didn't. Milton Burrow. Yeah, and he, uh, he was... Uh, he was in my house at uh, holiday times. They, they borrowed my uh, prayer book. Uh, not that we were religious, but I went to Temple Emmanuel to get uh, confirmed, not even bar mitzvah, because that was too orthodox for, for us. I didn't, my parents didn't, want, uh, didn't put religion on me at all. I went to my father when I was like 12, and I said, uh, Grandma thinks I should uh, go to Sunday school or something. Cause, uh, and he said, listen, it's up to you if you want to go. I'll send you. If you don't want to go, that's fine, it's, but it's up to you. And I thought I should go because my friends were going, and I thought it was an area I knew nothing about. So I went to Temple Emmanuel. Now, why did I go to there? Oh, because I had the prayer book that Milton needed <laughs> in order to say the right words when his mother died. So it was a big deal for me, you know, because he was Mr. Television in those days, uh, and uh, they, they, they needed my prayer book to say the words. Another anyway. Quest, another question? Uh, Jane, oh, help me. That's help it? Me. Do you finish oh. with Milton already? Milton is over? Thank you. Just repeat that for, for the camera. He liked, uh, he liked uh, the allergist's wife, the tale of the allergist's wife. The tale of the wife. Allergist's wife, yeah. We were talking about that a couple of minutes ago. It wasn't with Charles Bush, it was, it was by Charles, Charles Bush, yeah. So the question would be, uh, and he's quite a personality himself. Charles? Yes. Yes. I'm still stuck on Milton Berle. <laughs> <laughs> tell them about uh, Tell them the story about the, playing the character and then the man thinking that, uh, the actual doctor thinking that you were his brother. Well, uh, uh, there's a very, very wonderful charitable doctor by the name of Dr. Barry Cohn, K-O-H-N, who happens to be a very good friend of Charles Bush. And uh, Charles Bush based the character in Tale of the Allergist's Wife that I played on Barry Cohn, who is an allergist. And uh, Barry came to rehearsals uh, which was uh, unusual, uh, but he was there and assumed that he and I were brothers, in a sense, because I was playing him. Not him exactly, because I didn't know him, but I was playing the character that he knew was built around his quirks, his foibles, his personality. And uh, I'm happy to say that to this day, uh, uh, partly I'm healthy because of Dr. Barry Cohn, <laughs> and so are a lot of other actors. And uh, he's a good friend at this time, and uh, that's, uh, that's the story of Barry Cohn. Something else? I have, um, uh, there may be another question inspired in a moment, but I have a list of names here. Pick one and tell us a story. 
of people you've worked with, or a couple. Edward G. Robinson. I was in Edward G. Robinson's last job, which was for uh, an episode of The Twilight uh, Zone, hmm. uh, written by, um, um, won so many Emmys, uh, Rod, Rod Serling. Oh, thank Rod you, Serling, thank you sure. so much. I thought somebody else wrote that one. No. Right, would have been. Line, line, please. <laughs> no, Rod, Rod Serling. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Rod Serling wrote uh, a very good episode, and I played a doctor to a dying Edward G. Robinson, who was, of course, a huge hero of mine, and still is, and always will be. And uh, he invited me into his trailer to run lines with him. And he said to me, I hope you don't mind that I want to run these lines. He said, I'm, I'm always very nervous uh, before I do my first scene in anything. And I said, really? I said, I I'm that way too because I'm afraid I'm going to be fired. And he said, well, so am I. <laughs> I, I and I said, but you've made uh, 186 movies or something. And he said, it doesn't matter. He said, until they print the first one, I don't know that I'm going to be in that movie wow. or in that show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, we did this scene, and he was, I was reading, cameras, uh, reading lines off camera for him, and he was just brilliant, brilliant, lying in bed doing a monologue, it must have been three pages, and suddenly he stopped cold, dead in the water, and he said, I'm so sorry. He said, I have to apologize to everybody here. He said, but the focus man, the guy who takes the tape from the lens to you to get the exact distance so that you're in focus, he says, is saying my lines at the same time that I'm saying wow. them, and I can see it out of the corner of my eye, and it's distracting me. And he mm. said, I'm sorry. He said, years ago, it wouldn't have bothered me. He said, but now, he said, I have to concentrate so hard that anything that's going on in my eye line is a distraction. Wow. And then, of course, he did it again brilliantly the next time when they started. Imagine again. how that man felt who was saying the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, well, exactly. Julie yeah. Andrews. Julie Andrews and I were on a promotional tour for Victor Victoria in Minnesota. We had to be in Chicago the next day for interviews and the flights were canceled because of a terrible blizzard in the Midwest. But that didn't satisfy Blake Edwards, who knew we had to get the publicity from Chicago. The producer and her husband. Right? And the director. No. So he hired a private plane and ordered me to fly in it with him and Julie. And as we got to the plane, they were sweeping the snow away from the front tires and pushing it onto a runway. It was the plane the size of this stage. And I thought, am I crazy to do this? This is for a musical comedy. Is it worth dying for a musical <laughs> comedy? And then I thought, but I'm flying with Julie Andrews. How could anything go wrong? <laughs> she was Mary Poppins. <laughs> Rock Hudson. Rock Hudson. <laughs> Great guy, nice guy, had to beat him up. Had to beat him up in a uh, episode of, uh, uh, what's that, I can't, uh, not, Macmillan. Macmillan, Macmillan, and, wife. Macmillan and wife, yeah. 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 That's right, that's right. Uh, but a marvelous guy, uh, very uh, soft-spoken and uh, sweet, and I couldn't believe I was supposed to beat him up. Uh, and, 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 uh, and big, too. He took it very well. <laughs> How about um, spending time in France with get Catherine Deneuve and Yves Montand? Yeah, only it wasn't in France. Oh. It was at the end for the retakes, for the, for, the out, for, the, for, the, for the looping. But the picture I made with the two of them was shot in Venezuela, in Caracas. And uh, uh, they were charming people, and uh, they were the only people on the set who spoke enough English so that I could have a conversation with somebody, because I didn't speak Spanish. And we got to be very friendly after uh, several weeks and everything. As a matter of fact, we went out to dinner one night with Charles Aznavour, Ooh. who was starring in Caracas in the height of his career at the thing. And so they said, would you like to come with us for dinner? Dinner was at 11 o'clock at night or eight. So I said, sure. So we go to this place, and I'm sitting with Catherine Deneuve, Yves Montand, and uh, Charles Aznavour. And suddenly, a group of tourists from Texas <laughs> come from the back of the audience and they recognized me from the edge of night, the soap opera. They didn't know who these three people were. 
<laughs> and they start handing me menus, these huge menus. Would you sign this to Abigail? And, I, and the most terrible conflict I ever had was, now do I say, would you also like Yves Montand and Catherine Deneuve? And I knew they would say, no, who were they? <laughs> So what did you do? I you signed it and, handed it back. and handed them back to them and then looked up at three faces that were aghast <laughs> because they didn't know who I was or if I, and I wasn't anybody at that point and they, and they were just dumbfounded. I never uh, was treated so differently, not that they weren't nice to me yeah, at yeah. the beginning, but now I was suddenly almost one of them. <laughs> It was nice. Oh, We've got to end soon. Uh, Let's end with a couple biggies. Well, they're all big names. Joan Crawford. Joan Crawford uh, came to visit her daughter and her daughter's husband, who happened to be the stage manager of Barefoot in the Park when I was in it. And uh, we were friendly, and his, uh, he invited me to their house for dinner one night. Uh, and Joan was not expected and not invited. But the doorbell rang after I'd been there for about half an hour, and it was Joan who arrived with her chauffeur holding a, an enormous bowl of caviar. She was just passing by. <laughs> <laughs> and she came up to the apartment and sort of joined the table. And it was the five of, five of us? I was there alone, so it's four of us now. And Joan Crawford turns to me and she says, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm in rehearsals for a musical on Broadway. A musical? She said, yes. Did you have to sing? I said, yes. She said, and do you have to dance? I said, yes. And that's very difficult for me because I'm not really a dancer. She said, really? Well, <clears throat> she says, get on the floor. Show me something. Show me some, 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 leg, some leg lifts. You have to do leg lifts if you're going to be a dancer. So I get on the floor of this apartment, this brownstone on the east side, and she gets on the floor next to me. And it's now a duel as to who can do more leg raises higher. <laughs> And she won. <laughs> I was 28. She was 57. Fabulous. <laughs> what else do you remember about, you know, we, we're, we're passing through so many names. I mean, the stories and the visualization of the situations is interesting. What do you, let's just backtrack a little bit with Osnivore, Deneuve, Montan, Joan Crawford. Do you remember anything about the conversation, their characteristics, what they seem like, you know, not as people on the silver screen, but just somebody sitting across from you at dinner? Well, I mean, some of them are outsized. You know, they, they really don't belong in a, uh, an intimate setting. They're too big. Really? Uh, they're, they're, they're almost uncomfortable with it. And I felt that way with, uh, well, obviously, Joan knew how to make herself feel comfortable. Right. <laughs> But uh, they're like larger than life personas, personalities, mm -hmm. and they, they, they dominate the room. Could you yourself <clears throat> feel comfortable with them totally? With those larger than life? When in a social situation, I mean, you grew up in the business, you're not intimidated. I mean, geez, you spent time with Zero Mostel, you can't be intimidated by anybody. Um, but would you feel, hey, I'm really being Tony, or I'm just watching them? and asking them questions and responding to them. I think it's a matter of, of, of deference, deference that you yeah. give to someone who you realize has great stature. And the, they would, these people had great stature. They were legends. And I never thought of myself, and still don't, as any kind of legend or any kind of stature or any of that stuff. I don't. I, I, I always thought I was a spear carrier. <laughs> Even when I was starring on Broadway, uh, and I did 23 shows on Broadway, I still always felt like I was carrying a spear. Huh. And um, that's just uh, the way I uh, saw myself in relation to things. Uh, so it's a very nice surprise to be as uh, appreciated as uh, I have been here tonight. Oh, it's and, wonderful. Uh, but I, I, uh, I, I didn't carry around with me uh, the sense that I, I tell you, I learned something very early on about, about fame and everything, is that if you go out looking to be recognized and you're not, you're disappointed. If you go out not thinking about it and somebody recognizes you, you got a feather in your cap or you say, how do you like that? They remembered something I did. They know who I am. They were pleased to say hello. If you go out looking for that and you think, now I'm here, let's see how many people are going to 
You, that way lies madness. That, that way lies madness. Mm. So I, I, I very early on, when I was just starting to get famous, I mean, not famous, I got recognized the first few times in Macy's basement by women who watched soap operas, who said, oh, aren't you Lee Pollock? Aren't you Lee Pollock? And I said, no, I just play Lee Pollock. <laughs> My name is, no, you Lee Pollock, you Lee Pollock. And uh, it was very peculiar uh, in a way. Uh, yeah, but, I never, I, but the best thing I ever learned was not to go expect Looking that forward. you're something that everybody should know or should pay attention or should be, don't do that, don't do that. I'm, another thing I was wondering about just coming over here was if you look at this long, really successful, extraordinarily colorful career, if you had to take one, this is maybe tough, but one moment during work, either on stage, in a film, on television, when you just thought, my God, look what I'm doing, look what happened. One but, epiphany but, of your own accomplishment. Believe it or not, I have to give you two. I can't give you one. One is being directed by Jerome Robbins as Tevya at a rehearsal after I'd already done it for eight months on Broadway and he restaged the whole thing for Japan. And he got in my face for about 45 minutes of it could have been Lee Strasberg, it could have been um, um, uh, Sanford Meisner, it could have been uh, Konstantin Stanislavski. He took me to a place only a great uh, director, mm. uh, obsessed with getting it right, which he was, could have done. And I never had as intense a, a, a session like that at any point in my life, but he took me someplace I could go back to. Wow. I mean. It wasn't like it happened once and then you didn't know where it was. He took you to a place that said, you see this? This is red. This is the color red. This is what it looks like. If it looks anything other than that, you're not doing it. And in a sense that he made me feel what I was doing and how intensely it had to be done, I saw what red was. Wow. And I never, I never uh, 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 tried to do anything less than that. I'm sure I did many times. But that was like a goal he established in my head that I never would have found had he not forced me through berating and through pleading and through urging and through acting out on his knees alongside of me mm. to get me to that place that Tevye got to. That that was the best, the best experience I ever had in acting. And it wasn't in front of an audience, yeah. it was at a rehearsal. But it was a journey to some place. And the uh, other moment is... Let me follow is, up quickly yeah, with that, sorry. Though, if you can. How was your Tevye different after that? If you had done the Tevye for a long time. Tevye is a tremendous... I just happened to watch Fiddler on the Roof last Sunday. Uh -huh. a yeah. Tremendous character. Yeah. But so you, after this moment of 40 minutes, whatever, how did your man become different? Well, first of all, it was 25 years ago almost, so I can't remember how it was different. Well, okay. I don't remember what I did before, and I, I only know that I took a leap in mm -hmm. terms of my own uh, depth of portrayal. Other than that, in general terms, right. I can't tell you. I can tell you that at one point a, 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 a false tooth fell out of my mouth <laughs> on stage in Japan, and I uh, had a moment in front of the audience to contemplate whether I should pretend it didn't fall out, <laughs> in which case it would be lying on the stage and I'd never see it again. <laughs> and it cost a lot of money. <laughs> and I was in Japan, didn't want to go to a dentist. So I All this is going through your mind totally, on stage. Right? Totally. And I had to get off quick because the lights are all on computers and cues and there were going to be 40 people coming in a set change and I had to say this one last line and they can exit. So I said, and so, I said, because my tooth was risen. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Tevya <laughs> moved to the eastern part of Russia and everybody was great. And I walked off. <laughs> and the, uh, you got it. Uh, and then you said, when I asked you this question about that personal, personal moment of epiphany with your own accomplishment, you said there were two. Well, the opening night of Promises, Promises in London, mm. 
Every actor's dream, every American actor's dream is to work in England anyway, at least once to do something. And I had the privilege of opening Promises, Promises in London, which Jerry Orbach did here in New York and won the Tony Award for. And I won the equivalent of that award in London. And on opening night, uh, Donna McKechnie had stopped the show, stopped the show with her number, and they would not let us off the stage. It was one of those things that went on and on, standing ovation from an English audience in an mm. English theater. That was a dream come true. How do you get to sleep that night when you go home? Not easy. Uh, I don't remember. I was awakened early in the morning by the press agent who read me the first review from the London Times, which said, and this was by a very famous critic in London, if you live to be, go to see Tony Roberts in Promises, Promises. If you live to be a hundred, you'll never regret it. And I, I, I woke up to that the next morning. So uh, that was a great uh, experience in my life. Now, that's why in the song it says everything about it is appealing. <laughs> you know? Mr. Tony Roberts, what an evening Thank together. You, sir. Really wonderful. Thank you very really much. Really wonderful Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank we, you. Have a, we have a, an epilogue question. Good. What's next on your agenda and what would you like to accomplish? My, what's next on my agenda and what would I like to accomplish? Well, I have a, a film uh, uh, in the can, as they say, that I have very high hopes for. Uh, which may be ill-founded, but I did see a rough cut of it, and I, 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 uh, I thought it was funny. It stars Jason Bateman, Olivia Wilde, and um, uh, Billy Crudup, three very good people, in a movie written and directed by a guy who, who looks a lot like Woody Allen, and uh, who, uh, please God, has uh, his gifts, uh, but that's called The Longest Week. And uh, if and when uh, that's released, as I'm sure it will be at some point, what I hope it accomplishes is to get me another job. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's the most I can hope for. You know. One day they told you you would not go far, and the next day you wake up. Yeah, I'm still at the YMHA. Look how far I've come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. <laughs> uh, what an ending, huh? <laughs> that's a good one, my notes. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.